Ahora farem la, la següent xerrada, eh, la, el panel de Decidim Stories, eh, que modera la Elisenda Ortega de la Direcció d'Innovació Democràtica i aquí ja dono pas perquè, perquè comencem. Estem a, a la primera taula de Decidim. Yeah, this is the first uh, panel, the first round table, Decidim Stories. Carol? already mentioned uh, these uh, three great uh, projects and put in all these strategies from Decidim beyond to our minds is Decidim Barcelona, right? All of us here, but also in uh, city councils think about this. But today we have three projects that go beyond cities different levels, different scales, new projects, very recent projects, and despite the differences amongst them, the three of them contribute with a very, very interesting perspectives. And needless to say that they had to be here with us today. I'd like to introduce the speakers. We have uh, Carla Gipaiva Becerra. Uh, she's La Carla is a political science at Sao Paulo University, degree of Brazilian University, on that civil servant of public, uh, federal civil servant for public policies and department management. And she's leading Brazil Participativo, which is the body of TCDIM from the Brazilian government that, well, reach more than 400,000 registered people. So that's a great and uh, gigantic jump. We do have Darina Sterina, right? Darina Sterina, she's a coordinator of Envy Project, right? For empowerment of migrant people when dealing with inclusion policies. She's the coordinator specifically of this project in Germany. The German project is co-founded by uh, the European Commission and it is uh, being launched in different countries. We do have Romy Krasbrugger, sorry for the pronunciation, and she is the founder of the participation office in Vienna, Austria. It is an office that helps municipalities, public institutions, and civil society to create participatory projects through DECIDIM. Therefore, Romy uh, works with different uh, administrations and different bodies in Europe in order to use DECIDIM as a participatory platform. And finally, we have Antonio Casado, permanent researcher at the University of the Basque Country. He is leading a project for the provincial uh, government of Guipúzcoa, thinking about Guipúzcoa 2030, and it has been developed in uh, different counties. Uh, more than 25 researchers in, from different centers are involved, and well, uh, he, he is the first body of the CDM in Guipúzcoa. So we'll be asking four questions. They will have five minutes <laughs> to answer the question and to tell us, uh, to talk with us. And the first question, make a brief description of your projects. Describe your project. Brazil Participativo, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carla Bezerra, and I'm from Brazil. I'll be presenting in English, because I was asked, and I prepared on this language. Uh, but please, if anyone needs to, to get the translation on. Uh, so what, what do we aim at? Uh, OK. Brazil, uh, Brazil Participativo, which literally means participatory Brazil, aims to be the hub that integrates all the federal participatory experiences in Brazil. As you do know, we have several different formats of conferences, public councils, and we do want to entangle massive digital and in-person uh, processes within uh, this platform. So this is an effort. I think this is like one of our key 
things is not to think of digital separate from the in-person processes. So we kind of try to bring together all of our experience in participatory uh, spaces into the digital platform. Uh, okay. So we do have, like, I will not go into detail of all, all the different types of participatory spaces that we have had been developing in the last 30 years, 35 years in Brazil, but we do have like the national policy conferences, participatory budgeting most at local level and we are challenged to make it at federal level for the first time, uh, public consultations, participatory councils, and well, our first experience at the platform, which is the multi-year participatory plan, which I'll go into further detail later. If we look at the timeline for uh, digital experiences in Brazil, we began in 2009 with like small, tiny, uh, experimental digital processes into conferences or like participatory uh, observatory spaces, uh, public consultations that were mainly and exclusively digital and they would bring together a so, couple thousands of participants, but they were much smaller than this last process that we brought together, 1.4 billion million people participating. Uh, and how did we do that? So we did it together. We had 27 in-person in all of the, all of the states of the, the Federation that would bring together each around like 2,000 people. And this would serve as a mobilization, uh, mobilization to bring people to vote and propose in the platform. So we had about uh, one, uh, a million forty uh, four hundred uh, participants that presented about eight thousand proposals and voted uh, on which in, in each one. The most voted pr proposals would have around uh, twenty to ninety thousand votes each. And we had like this, this detailed numbers. Uh, so what are we doing next? Please let me know if I'm on time. So what are we doing next? So this was the first process, the uh, multi-year participatory plan, which I can go into. It has a lot of detail into the process. What does it make? It kind of defines the next four-year priority policies in all the areas of the government. That's why we had such a huge participation, because it's a huge, uh, important uh, planning tool for the government. And we are doing next, um, okay, we are, for, for as a next step, we are trying to uh, customize the platform to each of the different participatory spaces that we have. So the idea of national conferences, we have like, it's a kind of assembly process that starts at the local level and then you elect delegates for the state level that elects delegates for the national level. And you want the platform to participate, to be part and support all this process from the very beginning up to the national level and try to track, because many times we lose the track of the participants that participate in all the, the levels. So the idea is that the platform will help on that. And we will also have a digital um, voting tool that will allow people that, to participate directly online and then be elected delegates for the national level. So we are beginning with two. One minute, one uh, we are beginning with two um, pilot conferences: the youth conference and the food and nutrition uh, conference that are now online and will be uh, will will hold their uh, in-person national uh, moment uh, event at uh, in December. So it's already on, and you can look at this in the platform. Uh, and for the next year, we are going to have around. 15 uh, national conferences at different policy areas. We are also bringing together, like we had a previous uh, public consultation platform that was, has been on for about 10 years and we are merging it into the new deciding platform. It uses another language and it's not uh, able to be further developed, so we are also merging this. So that's all, uh, all for now, then I'll, I'll bring more stuff into the Q&A. And this is our team. There are many people, uh, we have about five people here. So we have the secretary, Renato Simões, we have Carla, Henrique, lots of people that are participating and you can take a look at it. Now it's the turn of the project MB. De, uh, 
Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, my name is Darina Sterina. Sorry, I have to switch this off. It's distracting me a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as already mentioned, um, I'm the German project coordinator for the MV project. It's called Empowering Migrant Voice Integration Inclusion Policies. And it's a two years project that is a EU funded by the Asylum Migration Integration Fund of the European Commission. And uh, we are, um, the project is implemented in five different countries, in Germany, Austria, Slovenia, Italy, and Greece. And what's special about the project is that we are 12 partners in it, and we are NGOs and also municipalities that are working together. And um, the focus is the strengthening, strengthening of political participation of migrants, and especially we're focusing on political structures that already exist and especially for people that do not have voting rights in their nation, national countries. And uh, so the idea was uh, to create this project for knowledge sharing and then also to exchange good practices of political participation that exists for migrants. And so um, we, have diff we um, share different good practices and we also elaborated them through different kinds of research in every project country and um, one structure that we found was really worth um, strengthening and the good practice were migrant advisory councils and the involvement of migrant organizations in the decision taking. And um, so what we observed through the research were also some that there are still some opportunities missing um, regarding those migrants that do not have um, this direct access through organizations or that are not directly involved in decision making processes of the municipalities. And also, of course, those that maybe just arrived or that do not have the national language skills. So we thought that the e-participation platform Decidim could be a great opportunity to um, include this and to um, also make it more accessible to those kind of uh, people. And um, so what we liked about it is because all our like national and local contexts are very different, we have different situation regarding our political situations, our governments um, on the local level. So what we liked about it was that we can really implement it um, really tailored to our local needs in the project countries. So for instance, in Berlin, we um, use the Decident platform for our migrant advisory councils because we have them in every district. And um, Wireless Luster now is using it for the whole um, community there. And Graz, for instance, um, uses it as a major um, project to involve uh, migrants in um, different advices for policymakers regarding different areas that concern better, like bettering of the situation for migrants in many areas, such as environmental issues, education, and so on. So this is something that Desidem offers for all of us. And um, also what we liked about it is the, mm -hmm, the tool, uh, the language tool. And um, we also liked it that we could also, because we have also different, um, from, like different, different migrants and different communities living in each of these countries and especially in these regions that we're working in. And so it was also great to, um, to make these platforms accessible in different kinds of languages so that people can directly in their own language, um, yeah, suggest, make ideas, and uh, participate directly. And um, yeah, so this was also, in, in each country, this was also a process where we included the administration, and in each country it's uh, different. So in some cases, the NGOs um, are using this platform for themselves. In some um, cases, the administration directly implements it after this collaboration process. And um, because it's a project that will end this year, we were also thinking in terms of sustainability of these platforms. And so we have the hosting and the maintenance until 2025 um, to make it possible for the activists to continue to use it, and also for the administrations to um, continue working with it also after the project ends. Thank you. Thank you. Antonio. Thank you very much. Now we move to Antonio. Well, uh, dia. Gracias. Good morning. Thank you, Elizenda. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here sharing the floor with so, such a beautiful uh, Decidim instances and, and with you all, the, the Decidim community. Uh, 
Well, it, this is the tiniest uh, project. The tini this is a very small uh, instance, but it's got a, a great team behind. So first of all, I wanted to thank everyone. I, I won't say names, but everyone at Collectic here in Canodrome, everyone in Communicatic in, in Bilbao. And of course, well, uh, this is uh, powered by the University of the Basque Country. Uh, Xavier Barandiaran, my colleague from the university, is here too. And also the, the, the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council, as Carol Romero said, they, they were the first ones, you know, making the, this, this bet. Uh, so, so thank you. Uh, well, Gipuzkoa, perhaps some of you know it, uh, it's the, this is the smallest uh, province, the smallest region in, in the Spanish state. It's very dense, uh, even you know, 90 towns. And uh, for many reasons, uh, the, in the last seven years, the, um, the regional council, the, the provincial council, made this, uh, I think, uh, brave effort towards uh, collaborative governance and democratic innovation. Uh, the reasons, I mean, we all know about this, so, so I won't uh, go deep into, into this. Uh, and, and this is part of it. Uh, this is part of this uh, big collective effort in this tiny region in, uh, between France and, and Spain. Uh, well, this is our, our instance. Uh, and I, I think it's very hard. This is a very hard job, Elisenda, because uh, we, I think we, we tend to look at this as, as a territory, as a space, as a lab, because we are experimenting with civic tech. And civic tech is social tech, as Arnau has told us, but it's also digital tech. And we are very experiential in the sense that it's part research, it's part action, it's part community empowerment as well. And, you know, in collaborative governance, you need many different kinds of people, each one coming into the project because of their own reasons. So for a student, it will be something like service learning. For a researcher, it will be like, you know, uh, an exciting research project, but for the citizens involved, it will be just a way of, you know, making their voices heard. So it's very hard to describe it. It's many things at the same time, and probably it's the same thing for, for all of you. Uh, so we do different things. This is, uh, as, as everyone here, an ongoing project. We are doing it as we go and making it up as we go, of course. It's social innovation, after all. Uh, but it has to do with, with citizens' assemblies. Uh, Jaume mentioned them. And in Gipuzkoa, Gipuzkoa is the, the first place in the whole Basque country in which two citizen assemblies have been done in the last year. And this has been something huge for, for everyone involved in, in, you know, in governance or, or politics, I think. So it's a great opportunity, and we wanted to, to be part of it and to help. How? Well, uh, experimenting with the co-creation of questions, answers, and proposals. And of course, because of what I just said, uh, the CDM is just the perfect uh, place to do that because it has this nice match between the principles and the reality. So this is what we do. It's a space in which citizens, university people, you know, from students to staff, and local agents from the regional government and local uh, council towns, for instance, get together online and on-site to uh, experiment with this basic uh, units of collaborative governance and citizens' assemblies, which are, after all, you know, problems, questions, proposals, and the CDM is, is giving us a nice space uh, to, to put all that together. Because it's an experiment, it takes place over a year, this year, and it has this structure with a double diamond in which first we produce a, a big number of questions, more than 100 questions in those 15 workshops with citizens, and then we using a Delphi method, we have been prioritizing and refining those questions. And this is where we are now. We are giving, uh, we are answering those questions by uh, actionable proposals. I mean, we're not looking for theoretical questions. We're looking for practical uh, proposals to, to answer those, those questions that have been uh, emerged in this, in this process. It has all the nice, you know, bits and pieces of a decidim. So I won't go into this. For, for us, it's very important that it's fully bilingual, uh, and, and that's something that we are proud of. Uh, then uh, those are things that we can discuss in, in question and, a, uh, and, and answers. Uh, 
and probably you you have the same uh, you know uh, concerns about sustainability or or plurilingualism, but we can talk about that uh, later. Thank you. La segunda pregunta que fema al The question related to projects. Well, they will tell us about their experience throughout the CDM. They will explain us what new the CDM has brought when it comes to develop the projects. We start by Carla. Uh, our experience uh, has like three main um, aspects. The first one was that to reach the large number of people, we used the unique digital identity that the, the Brazilian federal government already has. We already have kind of a, a very developed digital government strategy. And we used, we kind of used this unique digital identity that already has a, uh, like, we have, uh, so just to, to, for you to understand the numbers, we have around 200 million people in Brazil. 148 uh, are internet users above 10 year old. So we, so we are kind of considering this number and most of them are, are already users of this digital, unique digital identity. So this allowed us for people, to, because they use this to reach for other uh, public services, such as uh, pensions or, or uh, cash transfers. So this allowed us to reach a big number of, of people. So I would say that this unique digital identity was like uh, something that we could count on from the Brazilian government infrastructure already. Another aspect was to make a simpler user interface. So we do have, uh, uh, the sitting is made mostly for a uh, local use, local territory, and it considers like several different participatory processes within a city. And when we're talking about like a federal uh, participatory process, they have a di different logic. You're not uh, so much territorialized, but you're more talking about policy at kind of a more abstract level. So you do have to make it simpler for people to understand why you're talking about processes that are already very complicated it themselves. So we kind of reduced uh, some information or functionalities that the CD had to make it simpler for people to understand and use. Uh, another thing it was to, to develop for mobile use. So I was most of, of like 62% of all Brazilian internet users use uh, access internet exclusively by mobile. So if you, didn't, if you do on desktop, we are going to have a much smaller number. And from our processes, 90% of people would access and vote and make proposals in the platform on, on their cell phones. So that was a very, very important key issue for us to, to develop. I would highlight these this three things, key main aspects. Gracias. Uh, Project Andy. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we are Mitgestalten Participationsbüro. We're responsible for the technical implementation of the MV platforms um, in several countries. And uh, we are based in Vienna, and I want to share some numbers with you. So 60% of uh, the population in Vienna currently um, does not vote in elections. 30% of them don't have the Austrian citizenship, hence they don't, ha don't have the right to vote. And uh, the other 30% do not make use um, of their right to vote. So just to highlight also the importance, not only about Desidim, and, um, and, and uh, participation and democracy, but in general, when we talk about democracy, we should be inclusive and we should tackle these issues. And uh, at the same time, we know that um, there are participation biases. So when we open participatory processes that are um, not, where participation is not being selected by random choice, but rather voluntarily, we know that the people who participate very often share um, some demographic uh, similarities. It's rather uh, male people that uh, express themselves. It's rather people who are really feeling comfortable to uh, express themselves written or orally in their mother tongue. So it's often educated people. Um, yeah, so, so this is something where the MV project gave us the opportunity 
um, to really to tackle these issues uh, and to work on these matters more in detail. So what we did at the first step is together with the partners, we held workshops. So in cooperation with the NGOs, with the migrant advisory councils, we tried to figure out what would be the main important things um, that migrant communities would need. And of course, language was the main issue because it is a re you need to feel comfortable to express yourself, um, particularly when you have to express yourself in a written way. So standing on the shoulders of giants of the Decidim community, we could use an already existing feature um, that includes machine translation. And uh, we adapted it a little bit and developed it further. And like that, we could um, also with a huge, um, huge investment in translation of the Decidim files, like the Decidim software files, we could make uh, the platform available in about, I think, 15 languages. So we were able to set up those uh, six uh, platforms in those languages. And another important issue was uh, to be mobile, like to be um, responsive, ideally mobile first, um, because not only when it comes to migrants, but also um, other like population um, do not even own uh, computers anymore. So this is also something that we would really highlight. But we had a certain budget, so <laughs> we had to operate uh, within this budget. So it's, it's not perfect and it's really a starting point. Um, but I think an important uh, question that was raised uh, thanks to the MB project, how to build really inclusive and really um, accessible platforms. And to end, I would like to um, share a video. I don't know if I can find our slides now here. Uh, you can, perhaps you can help me to put the, um, to the video on from the, that was the second slide from the MV project. Um, that's uh, a video from the platform of Graz. Um, that kind, because the platform was being used, as we usually say, that city is like the Lego for digital democracy. Um, different cities and municipalities had uh, different needs. Do you have it? No? It's not working. Anyways, um, so then I, I explained to you. preparan per després. Ara van a buscar-ho i... Okay, okay. Després el podrem veure després? No? Ah, doncs no és possible, no el tenim. Ah, doncs no... It's not, it's not that important. What I wanted to highlight is um, that with Decidim we could really serve different needs. Like we can build um, a platform for the migrant advisory councils in Berlin um, where we support them in organizing themselves and collaborating more. On the other hand, in Graz, we had a very broad process um, where the question was raised, what would make Graz a more livable city? And uh, another platform that was created was for the uh, city of Lustenau. It's a town uh, with 25,000 inhabitants in uh, Vorarlberg in Austria, and they said they want a fully fledged participation platform. And uh, so we could really design, like with this modules uh, of the city, we could really operate in a very flexible manner and always have this um, multilingualism integrated, which really got also good feedback from different partners. Gracias. Antonio? Well, uh, from my side, this is going to be very, not very technical, but I wanted to mention something that hasn't been mentioned before, which is trust. Uh, trust between the very different agents that come together in a project such as this. And this is them, the, the tech, the platform, is just one. And in collaborative governance or action research, it's a little bit like a dance. I mean, you don't know where the music is going to, to take you. For, uh, initially, the thing was not even on, on, the, on the board. But, you know, the research team made, made a decision and we convinced our other partners that, that using the system could be a good idea. Uh, but because of that, um, the, somehow the on-site action has been leading the online action and therefore the development of the, of the platform. Well, a little, uh, Carla just said it as well. I mean, it's presential, it's face-to-face, -face, and the system has always been like that. This is not new. But uh, for us, uh, this has been important in order to compromise. I mean, uh, we have had to learn not to be purists about anything in this project. And for instance, 
uh, I have to say that not everything has been done using uh, decidin components, for instance. There was uh, some you know, surveys that we have to use to do, using other software. Okay, well, uh, my, my lesson is that you know, the most important decidin component, and this, this I have learned <laughs> the hard way this year, is that uh, it's two, you know, the two T's, uh, team and time. And sometimes time and team uh, constraints uh, forced us to do things differently. And, and if you know, decisions have to be taken, we have always uh, you know, go for the collective rather than the individual, because after all, our project has to do with imagining the, fit, the future of Gipuzkoa, but uh, using collective intelligence. So for instance, our interaction with the platform is, uh, of course, it, it can be individual, you know, uh, people supporting different proposals, but uh, the workshops are very important in the sense that we use the workshops in order to imagine together and the results of the workshops go into the platform. So facilitation, orchestration, you know, uh, social skills are uh, very, very important. I would say even more important than the, the technical uh, skills. So as for user experience, it's more like an, a collective uh, experience rather than, a, uh, than an individual one. And uh, so the main lesson perhaps is that, uh, you know, for us on-site leads online and that the most important thing that we have is, and the most important asset is mutual trust. Uh, uh, that's the, the, the key thing in everything that, that we try to do. So uh, for us to, to give that trust to our partners, being part of the Decidim community was key because Decidim uh, not only looks good, it's good, uh, we believe that. And the transparency, the democratic warranties are very important to, to help understand that this is something that is worth our time, our effort, and our money. Gracias. Um, diuen que sí que tenim el vídeo, o sigui que ara mateix anem a visionar-lo. Sí? Estàs parada, estàs parada. No? No video for today. <laughs> no es possible? Per què? Per què? No video for today, but uh, it's fine. You can find it on the Graz um, dash gemeinsam dash gestalten dot at <laughs> if you want to, <laughs> to watch it. No, no, no problem. It was just meant to be to give you an impression of what we are doing, but it's Sí, això ja està interessant, segur. Oh, wow! Sí? Vinga. La tercera, eh? Decidim never gives up. Do you have ideas on how to make Graz even more livable for everyone? Then share your ideas at graz-gemeinsam-gestalten.at The online portal that carries your ideas into city politics. Many different people live in Graz, and that's beautiful, but not all people have the same rights. For example, many people are excluded from the right to vote. Through the online platform Graz-Gemeinsam-Gestalten.at, the ideas and suggestions of all people in Graz are heard. Especially if you don't have the right to vote in Graz, your voice is important. That's why Graz-Gemeinsam-Gestalten.at is available in 13 different languages. You can make suggestions, comment, like and share on social media. You are involved in an association, share it on the platform and network with others. In addition, the MigrantInnenbeirat Graz and Südwind offer associations tips for funding opportunities and information about rooms. So tell us, what do you need to feel even more at home in Graz? Register at graz-gemeinsam-gestalten.at and share your ideas.
Anem a la tercera pregunta d'avui, que és que avalueu la vostra experiència amb el decidim, les coses que us ha portat de coses positives, que penseu que caldria millorar i que ens avalueu la vostra experiència. En cinc minuts, també. Decidim ofers Uh, several functionalities and it's quite flexible to customize and to try to adapt to different situations. So, and all, so we were able to use uh, uh, like the assemblies um, functionality, for example, to customize to other formats that initially uh, were not thought for. So I think like the platform uh, highlight is this kind of uh, a big flexibility and possibility to customize to different several uh, processes. Uh, but uh, we faced a couple, uh, couple challenges. Uh, I've already mentioned the, the, the need to, to simplify it, uh, the user interface. And also like for analysis, we, we kind of, um, we missed the possibility of analyzing the access, who is voting, why. So we are kind of, uh, our team is, actually very involved into developing the analytics. Uh, both, uh, we have a, a data engineer team and a data visualization team that is working hard on building a new analytics visualization so that we can actually have reports, like uh, customized reports for each different process. I think this is something that we felt uh, we missed a lot in the first uh, national process, especially because we had so many people voting and participating in what it, we wanted to know oh, where, are part the, where are them from? Do we have like all the regions represented? And this we could only do, we had to do it uh, manually mostly. So I, I think this is a, a big challenge for the future uh, development of the CD. Another thing that we are working on now is the uh, accessibility features. So in, in Brazil we have to, it's uh, both politically and legally we have to comply with like uh, some in internet rules on accessibility, uh, for example, like um, Brazilian sign language, like everything has, every official website has to offer Brazilian sign language so that people with disabilities can access. And this was, was one feature that we also had to develop uh, further and we are working on to, to improve in the Decidim platform and I think it, it, it can be highly beneficial for all the Decidim uh, community. So I would think this, I think like the main, uh, the main positive thing is like the flexibility, the being a uh, part of a broad international community that we can rely on and we can discuss. Uh, and the challenges are on how do we add on these features of analytics and accessibility. And the present. For our project, as I mentioned earlier, we are different partners. So there's administration partners, but then also NGOs. And um, for um, we asked our partners before um, we came here what what they would like to assess, what would they like to um, to tell us about uh, their experience with Essendon. And we got different feedback regarding administration. For instance, there were some um, of our partners that said it's very easy to use and it's very um, user friendly, but then some struggled a little bit um, with the administration because especially those that are from NGOs who are not very like experienced in using such platforms, um, they um, were either hiring someone external who would um, administrate this for them or they, um, they, they really like suffered and it took them quite long uh, to, um, yeah, to make it um, yeah, to administer it. So, um, and then the language, of course, it is like one of the biggest advantages of this um, platform. And of course, it opens like a better access for so many groups and communities in our, um, the countries that we work in. Um, and on this, but on the same time, it's like a very difficult targeted group because um, they usually um, would go to counseling centers or to organizations and, um, would express their ideas mostly there and more within um, offline formats and events or maybe like in some some yeah more safe spaces so it's also i think something that um, has to be considered that not only because you implement language 
it's something that is automatically used by this group, but it rather has to be also connected with offline events and different kinds of formats where different multipliers can be involved. So as for Berlin, for instance, the migrant advisory councils or in Graz, the migrant organizations as well as the council. And so in this way, this language tool can really like, um, yeah, thrive in its, in its um, yeah, possibilities. And, um, but then of course, what would also be great and what we like seen as something maybe a bit um, missing was that Decidim itself should be also more translated in different languages. So the tool itself, um, which could also provide a better access in our opinion. And um, so in general, yeah, um, we had also, we also liked the different features, but on the same time, it was a bit overwhelming for us um, to really understand what kind of needs do we have on the ground and what is necessary to implement and what is maybe not necessary in our context. And again, as with um, all these kind of features, it was a challenge and of course an opportunity because it made also possible that we could really like make it needs tailored and really make it work in different local contexts and situations. Um, so again, this was also challenging, but I think um, also a great opportunity for us on the project. I'm sure that our challenges are your challenges too. So I will just quote five. And the first one is sustainability. Uh, we, we might secure funding for the next two years, but uh, deep down, it depends on whether this is useful for more than uh, just one agent. So we are in a negotiation with the, the funders and in order to define what's the mission of the project, uh, because that's, that's the, important, the most important thing for it to be sustainable. Uh, yeah, and for us, the key uh, for sustainability is making it open, making this space open to other players in the, in the arena. But of course, this needs some kind of compromise between the, the partners. So that's number one. Uh, I have said that one nice thing about ours is that, as, as the others, is uh, plurilingual, but Basque is the minority language. And, and even though ours was the first one in Gipuzkoa, it was not the first one in the whole of the Basque country so that we have had some coordinate, coordination issues with the translations into Basque. But uh, as here, Amesaga is helping us a lot, and we are kind of creating a network of Basque uh, Decidim uh, developers to, you know, to have a, a, you know, a unified front vis-a-vis uh, -vis you all, and, and thus you know, improve the quality of the Basque translations. Uh, because, you know, AI is impacting us because now everyone can translate anything into any other language, but the results are very poor, as you know. The third one is licensing. In our face-to-face -face experiences, we are using materials developed by other people. For instance, we are using a, a card game uh, developed in, in Finland, but it's not, you know, Creative Commons. So we are kind of struggling to find ways of sharing our stuff which is using stuff that is not Creative Commons as we want it to, to, to be. But, well, we'll find ways to share this, uh, of course. Uh, fourth one is interoperability. Uh, this is probably is too technical for me, but of course, you know, uh, we want the decisions to be grounded on the best science that we have, and the best science that we have depends on open data. And of course, we want to go towards a model of governance in which, you know, local agents can use our data, I mean, the kind of you know, proposals and data that we create and we put into our decision instance, and we want also to use the data that you know, local uh, agencies are generating in order for the citizens using decision to arrive to better decisions. So this takes a lot of interoperability, and we think that that's a hot spot for us. Uh, and finally, uh, networking. Uh, of course, we, we are have the Basque uh, small network, but because we are developing these tools using others, but uh, we want to you know, talk to all of you about the stuff that we are doing. We are very hot on, on games, for instance, using games uh, to structure the experience uh, in our workshops, because that, you know, that creates engagement. And, and I mean, uh, participation should be enjoyable. I mean, uh, life is hard enough. So we <laughs> So we keep uh, an eye on this, and of course we are we're, you know uh, academics and, and and you know local officers. So so we want to do things with the people who all of you who are working on those areas, like you know social innovation or 
or I know that many of you are, are, are here. So uh, let's open new channels and let's keep the conversation going. Molt bé. La darrera pregunta, que també han anat sortint algunes coses al llarg de les vostres intervencions, és quins són els reptes que teniu com a projecte respecte al Decidim? I answered this fourth question. I, I just remembered something for the mm -hmm. past question, which is uh, kind of an assumption why we choose to use this in, which is an open source uh, software that is uh, public sponsored, uh, has a political movement around it. I think like this is one key issue to highlight of the one of the main reasons why we chose to and why it is connected to, to what we believe that can be a sustainable public uh, software uh, in the future. So I think this is, when we assess our experience at the sitting, I think this is a, a kind of an assumption. I didn't mention it before, but I think it's like one of the main highlights and one of the things that we are looking forward to, um, to support in the future. And now like, so bringing to the challenges, the same reason, the same advantage is also a challenge. So how do you think of this open source community uh, in the long run? How do we keep the, the software sustainable? How do we keep the community active? How do we think about uh, the challenges of, of the software governance? Uh, I think these are, these are like the main, uh, Antonio has already mentioned this before, and I think like, we are very much in line with how do we think of these challenges for, uh, for the future. How do we make this software not something that will like, uh, be part that is connected, uh, that m most of like, the digital experiences in Brazil that we, we presented were related to one government. And the government uh, went down, the, this, the experience was interrupted. How do we do not uh, fall into that? And I think this is related to building and strengthening an international community that is committed to uh, this open source participatory digital space. So I think this is like the main challenge that we have to face in the future to come. Uh, and like all the technical issues and things that we, uh, performance, scalability, or uh, usability, we can uh, solve together if we have, if we're able to build a strong uh, international development community. So that's, that's I think, the, for the future what we have to think of. Um, <laughs> so I think a lot of the challenges that we faced have already been mentioned, um, be, being it uh, the engagement of people, um, the trust, like being an, if you launch a new platform that you are trustworthy enough that people really trust you to invest their time and their ideas into this platform, the sustainability as well, but uh, from an operational level, what um, wasn't mentioned so far, I don't know if it's so interesting for you, but for us but specifically, um, the, the sticking to the time plan was really a huge challenge because so many actors are involved. Um, it's kind of the positive aspect and the challenges are one side of a two-sided coin. So it means that um, it is a civil society driven project. So MV was developed by civil society actors in cooperation with municipalities. But to convince the municipalities to really go for their city and to use it um, to explain everything to them. So this, this took time and uh, we really we couldn't uh, stick to the time plan exactly. Um, but finally we made it to have all passed all the, the important deadlines and that's it. I subscribe to all of that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my job is very easy now. Uh, just so I'm, I'm going to repeat, but from going from the more concrete to the more philosophical, uh, in order to network, I mean, we, we want to, to connect with the new citizen assemblies that are going to, to take place in the Basque Country. And for that, we're keeping an eye on, on Barcelona, on, on the climate assembly, of course, but also in new things like Volem de Sidir, which for us is very, is very exciting because, I mean, we are all about the future and you know the young ones uh, who don't have a vote as well 
uh, well, they are going to, to live in it or they are going to suffer it. So they, we want to bring them into the conversation. Uh, as, as Carla said, you know, uh, surfing the political tides uh, for, for this to be, you know, uh, continuous and, and, and not just, uh, you know, one flower one day and then it's all over to, you know, to zero and, and you have to start from, from scratch. I would rather go slow but not, you know, the, the, the least thing uh, we want to do is to waste our time and our resources on beginning again and again the, the, this new thing. <laughs> So uh, for that, uh, I think we need, you know, to, to develop some kind of political autonomy uh, as well in the in the decidim community and in the in this network of developers, academics, you know, local politicians, and, and you know, uh, open uh, so open software or open government uh, communities. Uh, creating that autonomy takes time, takes uh, you know, relationships, it needs trust. But, uh, and that's subtle, you know, and can go, you know, very, very wrong, but uh, this is perhaps the most important challenge. Because uh, in one of our narratives is this idea that the future is, is a common good. Uh, as any other common good, as, you know, water or, or natural resources, it can be destroyed by tragedies of the commons. So we need to, to learn to manage it. Uh, uh, using our, intelli our collective intelligence, as many communities have done all over history, all over the world, and deep down, that's our, our job, you know, to activate that in, in collective intelligence so that we manage for the future generations, you know, our cities, our regions, and, you know, our, our social problems. So that's it. Big job <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> Bé, malgrat ser project, tres projectes tan diferents, han sortit moltes coses comunes. Eh? Eh, s'ha parlat de inclusió, s'ha parlat de sostenibilitat, de confiança, de la importància de la comunitat i de la governança, de que decidim el seu projecte de software lliure que es construeix amb aquesta comunitat, la possibilitat de, de transformar-lo, de millorar-lo i de i de que sempre estigui eh, en eterna millora, no? per dir-ho així. Són coses comunes que han sortit també al, al, al tot el tema de, de fer una participació més inclusiva, tant a nivell de persones migrants, com, com de persones joves, com de persones que no tenen accés tampoc a, a les eines digitals. També ha estat un dels temes que ha sortit amb projectes tan diferents, a una escala com la de Brasil, amb un territori extensíssim i amb, i amb una escala molt més petita. No? Si el que faríem ara és obrir un torn de preguntes, a primer la fila zero, però bueno, tothom, tothom pot, pot preguntar els projectes el que, el que consideri. Sí? Alejandra? Sí? Uh, for Brazil, it was uh, a lot of sign ups in so little time, and that is very difficult. I did Mexico City, and we didn't get to those numbers. So I think a lot of it has to do with how is it promoted and what spaces are open for people to do that. So I want to ask you about it. I think, like, uh, the, as we mentioned, the digital process is not, like, on a... It relies on the political context. So we only were able to, to bring so much, so much people in such a short time because we had, first, uh, uh, um, it was uh, politically at the center of the uh, uh, president agenda. Like, Lula himself participated in, in a couple of the assemblies. And it was like we, we put a lot of effort uh, and we put a lot of political centrality to it. And it also relies on our hist history of like political participation and organization uh, from uh, popular movements, social movements. We already have like a, a quite strong uh, 
culture of participation. So we, when we activate this community that is already participating in in-person processes before, we can quickly bring together such uh, a significant number of people participating. So I think like the political uh, variable is explains like why the digital went so well. It's really, really very connected to it. You cannot uh, do that without relying on a, a very uh, strong community uh, participation culture and political um, priority like from the government for, for such to have big processes. Of course, we can we have to keep on, even if you don't have the political priority, it's important to keep on doing, but it will be hard to, to build a very big process in, in short time. Uh, so a follow-up follow question on this. Uh, mm -hmm. So you are talking about the centrality of, of Lula in the, in the process as well. How do you, um, how do you ensure like if Bolsonaro makes like a comeback here, how, how do you ensure the, the process is inclusive, is inclusive enough for the population so they don't feel this is like a political movement from one side, but rather kind of like a bottom up. Uh, and also speaking around like this, the sustainability of this to the long term, right? What, what happens uh, uh, after this government goes away uh, with, the, with the project? No, I think uh, I think inclusion is something that we're always looking for and we're never like at what our target, like it's the horizon that we're always looking for to more inclusion, more people. Of course, when you talk about digital uh, processes, there are lots of people who don't have internet access or do not have uh, internet abilities to use and to vote. So this already kind of... Uh, um, put some people apart and we, are, we have to always be looking to, to bridge that gap. Also, uh, I think like the in-person processes were a big effort to connect. So we would, uh, for example, for each, uh, each assembly that we, do, we would do in the state level, we would first go and connect with social movement le leaders at the local level and try to talk to them, mobilize them, then that we would define a political agenda to be presented in the assembly. And so they, the social movements themselves would connect. Of course, this would not bring all the, so not all the social movements from all the political uh, positions. Sometimes we would have some, some people from the opposition, the assemblies, but uh, it, it really varies according to, to, to the local reality of that, of each state, because you like, from the 27 states, the majority is either in the opposition of Lula or uh, kind of like in the center or negotiating. So we do have very different realities according to the place. So I would say there is no uh, one answer to it, but it's just like we're something that we are always, we, are, we will try to talk to the most uh, diverse social movements in that state. We would try to bring the most diverse uh, leaders uh, to be part and to mobilize for those assemblies and then to try and also we, we had also an internet uh, strategy with influencers trying to bring people directly from internet to participate so we would have an in-person and also no, an online strategy for mobilization okay. uh, a great question by the way and um, because there is just more than one answer as, as Carla said from the other side of the spectrum, somehow, well, uh, same problem. <laughs> uh, but Anglipusqua is tiny, it's small. Everyone knows what the other guy votes for. So what do we do? Uh, well, the difference here is that our project is led by the university, not by the government. And I think this is a good thing because it, uh, you know, the university is the public university. It has a good reputation. Uh, it's... Mm, perceived as neutral from people from different places of the political spectrum. And I think that has helped us to, to keep the, the process, the, the research inclusive and non-partisan uh, because people perceived us as non-partisan. And uh, on the other hand, it forces us to, to, you know, to respect that and to be you know, true to it. And in that sense, there is always a tension because we, we tell this project is not the, is not the, 
it's not the governments, it's the universities. Uh, it's everyone's. It's, it's owned by the people somehow, by like, the people. Uh, but uh, this gives it more legitimacy. Uh, that's our hope. So it's like a proxy legitimacy uh, move uh, in that the, the, the leader is not the government. Uh, the government is the, uh, you know, creates a proxy, you know, has an arrangement with the university, and from that moment on, it's the university that leads the whole of it. Hi, hello, I'm Katarzyna from the city of Gdańsk. Uh, we are now in the process of deciding about the tool uh, to support our partic participatory processes uh, and to digitalize them. Uh, so we are strongly thinking about Decidim. But I would like to ask you uh, about your tips maybe, because we all cope with, uh, I think, the challenge of participation, that uh, it is the great participation, both uh, digital and on-site, it's the great tool for people, activists, uh, communities that are already active. How do you, and my question is, how do you use Decidim to um, reach uh, excluded communities, people that are not aware about the processes or are afraid of using this tool of democracy? Maybe do you have some ideas that could help us? Thank you. So for us, um, as I already mentioned, our target group is maybe some like because we're working together with migrants that also have different residency status. And so um, in, in the research that we observed is, of course, trust for to the administration, like always an issue. And so um, what was good for us to maybe overcome this kind of um, yeah, this kind of um, trust problems is that we um, are, for instance, like as we are um, a migrant umbrella organization, so we already work together with migrants for a very long time. And as do also the migrant advisory councils. In Berlin, we have a participation law that was passed in 2021, um, which kind of also gave like a legal uh, ground for this migrant advisory council. And these councils, they are like a, a middle like institution entity between the administration, the migrant organizations and different kinds of activists. So what we try to do is to bring them very early on board. When we were planning to do this participation platform in Berlin, um, we were also doing within the project different kinds of workshops for strengthening these entities. And we were asking them already that we were mentioning that we're planning to do this kind of participation platform that uh, we want also maybe the administration to take it over to use it when the project ends so what would be like a good like idea what should this platform do what should what how can it help for you to organize or maybe to reach other people in districts and so uh, we really try to involve them already when we chose the features for our platform we already asked them about um, their their yeah their needs basically and how this can also um, like supplement and um, help them to do what they do on the ground, what they do in person. Um, and I guess that many of these members of this council, they are also migrant, they work for migrant organizations or they work in different kinds of areas where they really are connected to the migrants. So they are also directly this multiplier, so they can um, reach out. And um, of course, it's a long process, but um, I think it's a sustainable one because it was created already with um, the um, with migrants themselves. Yeah. I would emphasize this to include uh, the target group as from early as early on as possible, and then um, usually for us, um, referring particularly on the platform of Decidim, since you're thinking about which tool to choose. Um, usually in the beginning, we do a really professional um, engagement strategy where we think about who is the target group, who do you want to reach. Um, what are interesting multipliers? What are active organizations? How can they help you? How can they support you? 
um, what could be a good story that you could also tell journalists in order to make the platform better known, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, what's very handy in Decidim is that you have the social media integration, that you can share proposals, that you can send newsletters, so you can encourage the community that you already have on your platform to share their proposals, their ideas on social media, and hence, like that, you get a broader um, reach. So this is, these are some um, aspects. And then, of course, the, the offline events. So particularly in the MV project, um, those offline events are really, really um, necessary. <laughs> and, and do videos of them, and you know, so that people see who are the faces, who are the institutions behind all these projects. And even if they can't participate in person, um, they see, you know, and feel what's also the spirit behind the whole project. Yes, well, great question, and I have very little to add, but perhaps I don't see it as a very technical question. It has to do more with the design of the whole uh, process. And uh, in addition to what uh, has been said, uh, for me, the, the assembly component in Decidim is, is great. Uh, we are very sorry that we are not using it as, as much as, as we want, wanted to. This is something we are learning the hard way. Because the assembly is, is, is great to have an assembly with you know all the key players, not only the the steering group that is doing the hard work day by day, but also the main you know uh, stakeholders in order to have you know like a safe space in which all the difficult conversations take place, and that's I think that's a very important thing for the healthy for a healthy project somehow. Uh, it takes time, but you know the system helps. You know with the with the assembly. So uh, next time we'll we'll put extra strength on on that. Tenim temps para para més preguntes. Sí, allà. Hi. Uh, hey, a question for Carla to the project of Brazil. Uh, when you talk about the uh, visual reports you are uh, working on, uh, you are focusing internally to understand the metrics of participation, or you are focusing also to uh, accountability issues uh, to the citizens? So we can you hear me? Because I think it kind of felt here. Okay. Uh, so we are also focusing on um, the what we call the bringing back to the to the people that voted what how their decisions have been incorporated into the government policies. So we are we are uh, focusing this now regarding, for example, the multi-year plan. So what happened is the 20 most uh, voted uh, proposals from each policy area were uh, submitted to the ministries that analyzed and said, oh, this we can incorporate, this we can't. And we offered like a, an answer to why it had been incorporated or not. Many times it was actually kind of out of the scope of the policy. So we tried to do this answer, but about like 76% of all the proposals were in a way incorporated to the multi-year plan. Now it's submitted to the, to the Congress. So it's being voted and after, it, it, the bill is, is, has passed. We are going to also think of how to put it back. What, a, what after the, the process of, of uh, the, the parliamentarians, we'll, they might remove some of the participation. So we, we cannot avoid that. So we, cannot, we have also to show what has at the end remained of the, the, part, the participatory process, what remained in the bill. And we want to monitor it in the long run to, to see what has been implemented. So we, we do, we are working on that as well. Uh, I don't know if that was quite your uh, question, but... <laughs> uh. Yes, uh, mostly. And one thing that is very interesting is not only the, the numbers, no? the, if mm -hmm. the progress of the, uh, what is, has been implemented, but also the quality of the results not in order to make knowledge no, about uh, uh, what are our policies, we are uh, having the results expected or not, and even if we can uh, improve no, in the next iteration, then maybe it's interesting also this kind of uh, approach, uh, quality approach no, about uh, what are we uh, creating about, about with our citizens, 
and if you have plans in, in the direction. Thank you. Més de aquella noia i el, i el Xavier, pues els hi donem la paraula i després contestem. Sí? Well, well, I'm from Mexico and I want, well, that, this question is for everybody, but especially I think I, I want to ask to, to Brazil. So if you identify at this point, so if there are any variables, so socioeconomic variables that impact in the use of this kind of platforms in the context of participation. So Mexico is very inequality uh, country, Brazil too, so I don't know, I want to ask this. So this is... Thank you. Um, my question also could be taken by most of you, but again, Brazil is, is a change of scale, and particularly the aspect of having new developments that uh, on top of the CDIM or parallel to, to the CDIM, especially on data visualization. I'm curious to know what are your concerns regarding privacy? It's been very important in the CDIM from the very beginning to be privacy first. And I'm worried about uh, some types of visualizations or sometime, some types of urge to make it easier or more accessible that we might be sacrificing privacy and governments like Bolsonaro have shown us that they are perfectly ready and they have been historically to make uh, private data public, to prosecute people, Jewish, homosexuals, whatever, in different situations. Uh, and, and we need to be very responsible with uh, the data that, and, and, uh, and, and sometimes the visualization of the data because time attacks. I was worried when you mentioned uh, real-time visualizations because one way of knowing who voted for what is real-time visualization. And t timing is, is, is a very important issue in, in complex uh, privacy technical issues. I just wanted uh, to open the question about privacy and, uh, and the future of the city. Thank you. So uh, uh, about like the, the first question on, on social inequality, he kind of connects with the second. is like, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to have more data analytics is actually to see who is using the platform and not, and who are we reaching for. So we can see, for example, from the most voted proposals that uh, like uh, formal workers had an easier access to the platform because most of the most voted uh, proposals were from organized uh, worker unions ca categories. So we can see that mo like more organized sectors can reach for better participation. On the other hand, for example, indigenous communities uh, had a, a low participation level. So how do we kind of uh, reach for them? And I think like here we have some interesting uh, solutions on, on multi-language. So uh, Brazil, as a, a former colony, mostly speaks Portuguese. Uh, like, uh, but we do have uh, 200 indigenous populations that speak different languages, although they have a, a small, much different from Mexico, where you do have like a, like a huge number of the population that speaks indigenous languages. In Brazil, th this reality is related to up to one or two percent of the population. Most of like 98 percent of population speaks Portuguese, but we do have to reach out for this population. So how do we use like multi-language uh, skills? I think this is one, one side. Uh, how, how do we, we do have like several isolated uh, communities that have low internet access. How do we reach for, we have to think of like a, a, of a combined, uh, it's not only part about participation, but it's about reaching out with policy, like with access, with other things. So we do have to think it very carefully throughout. So uh, as I think it's connected to his uh, question, like in the beginning, we are always, we are always going to be uh, looking for more inclusion and participation. In, and if we are talking about a highly unequal country, that certainly will always be a big gap that we are going to, to try to fill. Um, regarding privacy, uh, in Brazil, we have to comply. We have a very recent uh, law that's called uh, the da data, uh, Data, I don't know how to translate it. LGDP, how, how, how do we translate that? 
uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we have to confine most of the, so the thing is like, as we use unique uh, digital identity, uh, we, have, we, can, we can connect to other information of, other, uh, the, of, of the same person that voted if they accessed well, different policies, but we cannot reach that uh, individually. We do not access, so like the, 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 we, we kind of, we can pull it from the general system of the, of the government, but we do not have it identified by person. We have it just like for anonymous analysis. So we do, we do have, uh, we are uh, very worried about this, uh, that this, the data privacy is specified in the terms of use and we've been updating the terms of use to make it uh, uh, comply with the legal um, requirements for the data privacy. But I think uh, that's a very good question and we have to be careful about this. So I think it, it's, it's important uh, that you raise this issue as well. Like concerning the privacy, um, we always appreciate the fact actually that um, privacy comes first with Decidim, so we're just uh, waiting for new developments and then taking a look into that. And uh, concerning the, the kind of the, what I said, the participation bias, and uh, if we do have any recommendations, I think we shared most of them. Um, and it's mainly the language. What we did in the beforehand, before we, uh, when we prepared this pr uh, presentation, we were asking our partners if they would have suggestions. So it's not really IT people, but just you know some some ideas. Um, and one of them wrote back, it would be nice um, if there would be a K um, AI tool that would translate oral language into written language, so that people who are not literate can contribute. So these are, but that's just you know ideas, and we are starting with this whole, on this whole journey. Yeah, but in general, maybe just like to add, um, I think it's, it's of course great to offer different features, how you can like give your ideas into like um, policies of the administration. But I think what is also important when you consider different kinds of people that have different experiences with working with administrations, important this um, issue of accountability and transparency that you also mentioned before. Because, of course, it's nice to have easy access to um, put in your ideas, but, of course, your ideas should also be, like, valued and assessed, as you mentioned before, and really, like, this also made transparent why didn't this certain idea come, uh, was included in this kind of policy, and um, also try maybe to, um, to encourage the people to actually put ideas in a way how it can be actually implemented into policy making. So I think this is something where we hope that the Migrant Advisory Councils having more experience with the administration could also maybe um, facilitate with the broader um, migrant um, community in Berlin. So, yeah. Okay. okay, well, first of all, thank you for, for your talks. They were really inspiring. I, I really enjoyed this last part about this tension between having uh, uh, data open, but at the same time, how to protect privacy. I think there is a trade that this is very complex to navigate because at, as you were uh, saying, like on the one hand, we want the data to understand uh, what is the participation about and possibly like try to identify biases that needs to be mitigated, but at the same time, like to protect uh, privacy is critical uh, for participants' integrity, for instance. So uh, this has been attention since the beginning in the CD, but also attention in many other spaces. So there have been approaches to try to address this challenge. So one of them is something called differential privacy, in which you have a data set and you just uh, uh, do some um, add some noise, so you manipulate with, uh, with a very low level uh, information about some participants. So the exact data is, is uh, the uh, resulting data set is not the same because there are some perturbation happening, but the aggregate and finally, uh, from statistical purposes, are equivalent. So I just wondering, and for instance, in the case of Brazil, you mentioned that you have a, a team of data engineering. If you are considering, uh, or I invite you to be pioneering of using differential privacy with the CDM to try to finally to provide the statistics about participants uh, while at the same time protecting uh, the integrity and the privacy of citizens.
preguntas, pero sería la última para que ya nos quedan cinco minutos. Sí? Pues andaban y, y después dice mal ponentes que tengan que tengan que ir la sesión. Andaban. Hello and thanks for these presentations. Very inspiring as well. Um, um, my question is with regards to um, the specificities of your constituencies and how do you manage content moderation on the platform accordingly? If you have developed a different model and a different approach than the, than the Decidim one, if you had to tailor it to the specific specificities, I'm thinking of Brazil, I'm thinking of Austria, I'm thinking the EU in general and the polarized societies, societies we live in. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, ours is very, very small and there is no content moderation. Of course, we are keeping an eye and we try to answer as, as soon as possible. So our focus is on, you know, uh, responsivity rather than and appreciation, uh, and, you know, and, and to, to, to have a positive uh, feedback loop. Uh, as I said, Gipuzkoa is, is a small, dense, highly dense uh, community in which there are uh, deep political rifts. And, you know, we have an history of, you know, political violence and straight repression. So some, some scars are still very open. Uh, so we have to be very careful. And, and, and some uh, topics that we are addressing in our, you know, futuring uh, activities have to do with you know, of course, energy transition, ecological transition, uh, digital transitions, and those are issues that people have uh, strong opinions about. So, but we welcome strong opinions. Uh, I mean, it can be uncomfortable, but our experience is that, especially in face-to-face -face interaction, uh, friction, there is no vision without friction. It's one of our mottos, actually, <laughs> something we learned uh, on the way. So, so we haven't had any problem with trolling or astroturfing in the digital, but probably because it, our numbers are very small, actually. And, and uh, on-site uh, activity has been leading online activity. We have had very few you know, external activity uh, uh, coming from people you know, out of the blue that, that happen to find the platform. And we are not looking, we are not fishing for that, actually. So we keep it very safe, <laughs> perhaps too safe or too small, but. Um, I'm not sure if I got your question uh, right. Were you uh, asking if you were considering other solutions for, um, for, the, city, for the platforms, for the participation? Uh, no, in a much simpler way, how do you reconcile the need, potential need for content moderation and indeed empowering the agonistics, the, the agonistic debate within the platform? And how did you go about it? Mm -hmm. um, like the questions that we were asking um, in the MB projects were usually very like broad and really kind of um, we were uh, collecting ideas, gathering ideas, and so content mo moderation was not uh, so much needed on the digital digital sphere because people contributed their ideas and there wasn't this um, friction kind of because it was just ideas that could be voted on, and uh, so so not that many conflicts. Um, but what we appreciate actually for more conflictive issues is really this strong um, aspect of uh, integrating um, offline sessions, workshops, etc. So for everything that is rather conflictive, um, we went for, for live formats. Mm -hmm. yeah, to go more into the depth of an issue. So, uh, moderation was a big issue for us. Actually, it was a condition for the government to accept that we actually would have a participatory process. Like, if you do not have moderation, we are not putting the platform on. So we, do, we did have a team of uh, 10 people working 7 to 7 on human moderation, the whole process, analyzing all, in all the 8,000 processes, uh, proposals were, ana uh, were analyzed. But... Uh, because we used the unique digital identity, so the people would have to, to log in uh, first, the amount of uh, worry about hate speech, uh, extreme right uh, pro uh, proposals, proposals against human rights and stuff like that were very low, actually. So at the end, out of the 8,254 <laughs> proposals, we had only 40 that had to be moderated, actually, that because they contained either a hate speech 
or they were like against basic human rights, like for example, defending uh, uh, very. I will not detail. I can't detail that on, on at the coffee break, but <laughs> putting very like uh, very um, extreme right wing uh, proposals against that that were very much against our constitutional principles or human rights. In those cases, we moderated, but it was like a very very tiny amount of proposals. So we actually reduced the moderation team for the other processes that are going on because we, we realized that we, using the unique uh, digital identity, you can avoid bots attacks and other kinds of things that actually kind of uh, disturb the, the, the real democratic uh, debate. Um, and regarding, uh, I don't know if it was kind of a, more a question or a, or a comment on, on data, the trend from data analysis to data protection, but I felt like we do have, uh, I, I wanted to comment about the, uh, the governance of how we structure the, the process. So we are located, uh, we are uh, located in the general secretariat of the presidents of the Republic, which is kind of like a ministry status, but we work together with other ministries. And the ministry that is responsible for uh, open data and digital government is the, uh, the Ministry for Digital um, for Management and Public Services Innovation. So we work closely with them. But a lot of issues regarding uh, data, open data, they, uh, they kind of handle it directly. We only rely on their expertise. So, uh, to, so, so, so they already like, uh, in, in, um, send the, all the aggregated data for us, so we, we do not reach or, or access this kind of detail. So some, some things I cannot answer because they deal with that directly. And we also have uh, a cooperation with the University of Brasilia. So besides using open source uh, software, we're all also uh, uh, doing like knowledge transfer and uh, uh, so most of our uh, of all the development that has been done is with the team of the University of Brasilia, who are here also represented, Carla and Davi, uh, and they coordinate the, the software team. And we so we also have in the University of Brasilia is a public federal university, so we also have this kind of like uh, what we think is important cooperation and, and knowledge transfer in the processes are also. Acaba el temps ja, d'aquesta xerrada. Moltes gràcies. I volia... Si, si voleu afegir en un minut alguna... Però... Sí, voleu afegir alguna cosa? No? Like with the MD project, I think we made the first step um, to foster the uh, inclusion of migrants more into the whole, like to consider this as a target group more for the whole Desidim community. And um, I hope that we can, can also contribute and share our learnings in uh, future events with the whole community. I think it's a very important aspect and I'm very grateful also for the opportunity to, for this cooperation. Yeah. Uh, Antonio, do you want to add something? Thanks, uh, thank you all. Thanks to all the community. Thank you all. Now let's have a coffee break uh, outside. Thank you very much.